The specialness of tonight uh, is in part a celebration of, uh, I would say, collegiality, colleagueship in ecumenism. So I want to invite um, a special person who will introduce um, our speaker and then um, invite another person, uh, the chair of our board, to come with me and uh, present the Ecumenism Award for this year. Um, the first person uh, is uh, Dr. Mitzi Buddy from Virginia Theological Seminary, a gifted ecumenist, um, recent president of the North American Academy of Ecumenists, um, very committed, um, her, uh, read her demon um, dissertation or a thesis on theological education and ecumenism, uh, lifting up some of the greatest models for um, ecumenical formation, um, and um, a wonderful colleague, uh, and also happens to be a neighbor uh, of ours. Uh, my wife Joyce and I live on the campus of Virginia Seminary where my spouse uh, uh, Joyce Mercer teaches. And uh, Mitzi is our next door neighbor. So Mitzi, I invite you to come and uh, introduce our speaker. And after that, I will invite uh, Diane Yeager, uh, the chair of our board, to help uh, present the Ecumenism Award. Thank you. I am greatly honored to have the opportunity to, to introduce to you my teacher, uh, John Ford. And in your booklet, you have the formal biography of him, and I'll just hit a few of the highlights and then say a few personal words. The Reverend Dr. John T. Ford is Professor of Theology and Religious Studies and Coordinator of the Hispanic Latino Programs at the Catholic University of America here in Washington, right across the street. He holds a licentiate and doctorate in theology from the Gregorian University in Rome. He has been a nationally and internationally known ecumenical leader for the past several decades. He has served as a past president for the North American Academy of Ecumenists and a member of many dialogues. Um, two that I want to lift up particularly are the dialogue on the consultation on church union which became Churches Uniting in Christ on which he served for several decades and um, member of the Faith and Order Commission of the National Council of Churches for which he served many, many quads and I was privileged to serve with him in the last quad on that. Uh, more about that in a moment. Besides ecumenism, he also has a particular research interest in the thought of John Henry Newman serving as a decade as editor-in-chief of Newman Studies Journal and editing the collected spiritual writings of Newman for Orbis Press. He has authored many ecumenical articles in journals including The Christian Century, Ecumenical Review, Journal of Ecumenical Studies, and Ecumenical Trends. He pioneered the use of case study methodology in ecumenism with his book, Twelve Tales Untold. Um, the subtitle is A Study Guide for Ecumenical Reception, which has been used as a textbook in many ecumenical classes for many years. Theological students of all denominational persuasions will be grateful for his theological dictionary the St. Mary's Press Glossary of Theological Terms, which he wrote. He also created the methodology that is used in the National Council of Churches Faith and Order Commission for its ecumenical dialogues and discussions, identifying areas of resonance, dissonance, and nonsense for 
conversation, and he has uh, sev published several articles that unpack the meaning of those terms. So on the former quad, when a member of the committee would say, well, is that dissonance or nonsense? We would just turn to John and say, Father John, <laughs> you tell us. Um, he created the methodology. And for the book project that came out of that um, study group, Unity in Mission, Theological Reflections on the Pilgrimage of Mission, it was Father John who first um, suggested the metaphor of pilgrimage for our study. And in his essay that he wrote to that, his deep commitment to Hispanic ministry came through in his essay as he likened the ecumenical journey to a way of the cross as well as a way of unity and a way of mission. Father Ford is a master at making ecumenical concepts accessible, famously likening ecumenical relations to, quote, a family reunion where long lost cousins finally meet, but in every ecumenical gathering, he says, there is the equivalent of pig's knuckles and sauerkraut, <laughs> beliefs and practices that are treasured by one community, but politely avoided, sometimes even deliberately rejected by other Christians. In such matters, he says, Christians need to act with caution, reverence, and respect. And I think that phrase really characterize, characterizes Father Ford's ministry, that he has lived this journey as a pilgrimage of mission, sometimes a way of the cross, always a way of mission and a way of unity, um, and always approaching all other Christians that he encounters as a witness of caution, reverence, and respect. And for that, we are so grateful to you, Father John. You have carried this journey for us forward for a, a generation now and uh, have taught many of us so much. I'm honored to present to you all this evening my teacher, mentor, and friend, Father John Ford. We take this opportunity to award um, Dr. Ford the 2015 Ecumenism Award of the Washington Theological Consortium. And uh, Diane Yeager, who is the chair of our Board of Trustees, will um, read what's on the award, and we will present it to John. I do want to tell just one story first. Uh, uh, Father Ford has chaired the Ecumenism Committee of the cons Consortium for a good many years. And uh, when I first came on the board, I was uh, appointed to the Ecumenism Committee. That was six years ago. And um, after meetings for years, uh, I would ride home with Mitzi or I would walk to the subway with someone who was on the committee and they would say, you know, who really deserves this award is John Ford. <laughs> But it would be so awkward with him chairing the committee. And anyway, he wouldn't think it was right. And so finally, Father Ford missed a committee meeting. So we have this plaque that says the Board of Trustees of the Washington Theological Consortium for his outstanding contributions to ecumenical dialogue and scholarship in major themes of Christian unity presents the 2015 Ecumenism Award to Dr. John Ford, CSC. Thank you very much. Vatican II's decree on ecumenism at age 50, an exhausted inheritance or a living legacy. And I read the title simply to check the acoustics, whether or not, whether or not uh, I'm coming across. Okay. 
Uh, that doesn't say that you have to agree with me, but I want you to hear me uh, so that if you have disagreement, you know what to disagree about. Okay, uh, let me start with one of my cousins. One of my cousins recently celebrated her 50th birthday, and she received a card that read, Happy 50th, congratulations, and condolences. <laughs> so, if nothing else, this is a warning to open your birthday cards in private. But I'd like to suggest that, presumably, congratulations for our achievement, as well as surviving a half century and reasonably good health. Condolences, perhaps for opportunities missed, for mistakes made, or perhaps because at age 50, you have something of a midlife crisis. In any case, for historical anniversaries as well as for people, the half century mark is a time for reminiscences about one's past. What have I accomplished? And reflections about one's future. What should I try to do next? The 50th anniversary of the Second Vatican Council has been celebrated by numerous events, with some of our questions about its historical significance and its future relevance. An answer to these questions about past and future is suggested by the subtitle, which is derived from the experience of another cousin who recently inherited four stock certificates. None of the companies were listed on any of the stock exchanges. Eventually, he learned that three of the companies went bankrupt long ago. The certificates were pretty pieces of paper that had no monetary value. But the fourth company, after several mergers and name changes, was still around doing reasonably well. And so that part of my cousin's legacy was still valuable. My cousin's experience prompts the question, does the anniversary of the Second Vatican Council provide a worthless inheritance or a living legacy that is valuable for the future? Anyone studying the Second Vatican Council quickly recognizes that it provided a mini mountain of documentation to consider our constitutions, major statements on liturgy, revelation, the church, the church in the modern world, nine decrees and three declarations, a few of that dozen, are duly and deservedly remembered only by church historians and connoisseurs of conciliar trivia. <laughs> but I'd like to suggest that other documents, like the Declaration on Religious Liberty, the Declaration on World Religions, and the Decree on Ecumenism, are still influencing contemporary Roman Catholicism and its ecumenical and interreligious relationships. What may not be evident, at least to the younger members of the audience, what may not be evident from reading these three documents was that they were approved only after considerable theological soul searching and conciliar debate. The decree on ecumenism in particular had an exceptionally long period of gestation, at least if you mark the beginning of the ecumenical movement with the International Missionary Conference at Edinburgh in 1910, the decree on ecumenism approved on November 21st, 1964. Incidentally, that is my birthday. I don't know whether it's <laughs> a coincidence or not, but it was approved on November 21st. But that document was preceded by more than a half century of ecumenism in which the Roman Catholic Church was generally a bystander and sometimes a naysayer. For example, 
such people documents as the encyclical Mortalium Animos of Pope Pius XI in 1928 advocated an ecumenism of return and accordingly there were no official Roman Catholic representation at the first two world con uh, conferences of the World Council of Churches. In fact, in 1954, when the World Council of Churches held its second conference at Evanston, Illinois, in Roman Catholics were officially invited not to attend by the Roman Catholic officials. 1954. In a surprising about face, ecclesiastically speaking, just seven years later, Pope John XXIII sent official Roman Catholic representatives to the Third World Conference at New Delhi. And a decade, just a decade after the World Conference at Evanston, the Second Vatican Council issued its decree on ecumenism. Nonetheless, the decree on ecumenism had a rather difficult birth at Vatican II. If you only look at the final vote at the Council, 2137 to 11, you say that must have been overwhelmingly unanimous. And it's true. The decree on ecumenism was de greeted with considerable enthusiasm by members of the worldwide ecumenical family who, like most families on the arrival of a new member, were perhaps overly optimistic about the newborn's future. <laughs> like most newborns, the decree on ecumenism had a noticeable number of family features. You might say even a few birthmarks, characteristic of the Roman Catholicism of the mid-20th century. On the one hand, the decree on ecumenism as the foundational document for Roman Catholic ecumenism displayed the distinctive DNA of both its day and its denomination. On the other hand, Roman Catholic theology in general has been considerably enhanced by Roman Catholic participation in the broader ecumenical movement during the past five decades. In regard to the distinctive DNA, one of the most important features, but one which is easily overlooked, is that the decree on ecumenism did not speak of Roman Catholic ecumenism because that would have suggested that Roman Catholicism has its own brand of ecumenism. The decree spoke of principles of Roman Catholic ecumenism, which suggests that there is one ecumenical movement in which the Roman Catholic Church participates in ways appropriate to its own traditions. Now, parenthetically, every church participates in the ecumenical movement according to its own traditions, according to its own principles, according to its own identity, according to its own integrity. Such participation is inevitable, both productive and problematic. Productive. Productive in benefiting from mutual encouragement in the search for Christian unity. Problematic. Problematic in light of the many church dividing issues that are obstacles to Christian unity. Roman Catholic participation in the ecumenical movement has admittedly been somewhat awkward and hesitant, like a teenager learning to dance. It has sometimes been two steps forward, one step sideways, one step backward, in effect, stumbling along and not always in time with the music. <laughs> in fact, some Roman Catholics, including some church officials, have more or less given mere lip service to ecumenism, sort of like those singers who lip sync along, but really do not know the words. A 
accordingly, most Roman Catholics today speak favorably of ecumenism, and certainly that is a good thing. Very few Catholics speak against ecumenism. But, unfortunately, comparatively few do much to advance ecumenism. In contrast, many Catholics at the time of Vatican II were overly optimistic about the future of ecumenism. They expected great things were going to happen, but with the passage of time, they found that Rome was not built in a day. As one of my ecumenical friends has remarked, ecumenism moves at the pace of the slowest participant. And still other people have been guilty of a type of ecumenical Pelagianism. The expectation that ecumenists can construct church unity on their own terms, forgetting the gift of unity is God's to give, not theirs to arrange, not theirs to negotiate. Ecumenists then need to remind themselves continually that ecumenism is incarnational. Simultaneous to human hands, yet fundamentally a gift from God. During the course of its participation in the ecumenical movement, the Roman Catholic Church has interacted in various ways with three major movements. The three major movements stemming from the World Missionary Conference at Edinburgh in 1910, which has come to be regarded as the origin of the ecumenical movement in general and the origin of the World Council of Churches in particular. These three movements, Faith and Order, Life and Work, the International Missionary Council, have sought to promote church unity, though in distinctly different approaches. Very briefly, Faith and Order, as its name suggests, has focused its attention on resolving two major types of church dividing issues. First, those of belief or doctrine. Second, those of church order or ecclesiastical structure. Second, life and work. In contrast, is encouraged Christians to live and work together as witnesses to Christ in the world. Even though they belong to different denominations, different denominations whose ways of worship and doctrinal teachings are often divergent. And third, the International Missionary Council has called for missionary cooperation, a common voice in proclaiming the gospel in mission lands, and encouraging the development of indigenous churches. Faced with the fact that people to whom the gospel is preached have been confused by denominational differences denominational divisiveness, the decree on ecumenism echoed the World Missionary Conference by declaring, such division openly contradicts the will of Christ. Such division scandalizes the world and damages the holy cause of proclaiming the gospel to every creature. Each of these three ecumenical approaches has both a lengthy history and a notable record of accomplishment. Achievements deserving at least a volume, if not more, and not more than a few simple comments can adequately respond. What I would like to do is take those five words, faith, order, life, work, mission, and use them as metrics for measuring a half century of Roman Catholic participation in the ecumenical movement. Such metrics represent this ecumenist prognosis of where Roman Catholic ecumenical endeavors need to develop in the future 
as well as metrics about where Roman Catholic ecumenism has come to date. In making such comments, I acknowledge in advance every metric is selective, maybe even subjective. But hopefully each metric will be thought-provoking, maybe even controversial. First metric, faith. In contrast to some five centuries of Protestant Catholic polemics, when denominational doctrinal statements were often polemical battlefields. For example, the teachings of the Council of Trent versus the Augsburg Confession. In contrast, a whole series of doctrinal agreements have emerged over the past five decades that, theologically speaking, have resolved many of the church dividing issues that date from the Reformation of the 16th century. For example, one very noteworthy achievement of bilateral dialogue is the joint declaration of the doctrine of justification, which addressed a pivotal Reformation issue, one that has been described as the Articulus Stantis et Cadentis Ecclesiae, a doctrinal position on which the church stands or falls. The joint declaration welcomed by many Lutheran and Roman Catholics, though not by all. At the same time, it's been uh, welcomed by members of other Christian traditions. Yet, the Joint Declaration was only one ecumenical agreement among many. There are numerous other consensus statements that attempt to resolve a whole range of questions that have long separated Christians. And while ecumenists should both be thankful and be thanked for such incredible theological consensus. They also need to be realistic about the limitations of theological consensus. First, as far as written agreements go, the good news is the sheer quantity of ecumenical agreements is exemplified by shelf after shelf of material and theological libraries. The bad news. Such ecumenical agreements are rarely checked out by anybody but theological students writing term papers. <laughs> Second, with some notable exceptions, not only do such ecumenical agreements go unread, they are rarely implemented at the local level. In fact, this seems to be due to the fact that the process that led to the production of these documents has not been replicated by people in the pews. These ecumenical agreements are somewhat like laws passed with a great deal of flourish and fanfare, but conveniently ignored in fact. Many of these agreements resolve doctrinal issues dating from the 16th century a few of these agreements address the many new theological issues confronting the churches today. Four, yet the contemporary obstacle to ecumenical consensus is perhaps not so much theological disinterest, not so much pastoral neglect, though these are obviously significant problems. The major difficulty that I see is an undoctrinalization of much of American Christianity. Many people simply no longer care about doctrinal issues, much less their resolution. Second metric, church order, ecclesiastical structure, ordained ministry and perhaps the very multiplicity of terms, is an indication that this set of questions has proved to be one of the most neurologic issues in the 
ecumenical search for church unity and has caused, in my opinion, some promising ecumenical conversations to be derailed, if not deleted. Although there is ample historical evidence that a threefold ordained ministry, bishop, presbyter, deacon, existed from the second to the 16th century, the evident need for structural reforms in the church at the time of the Reformation, as well as the desire for some reformers to return to scripture-based structures, resulted in three church-dividing modifications in ordained ministry that continue in various ways to be troubling in the present. First, the distinction between the laity and the ordained has sometimes been blurred, if not abolished. Second, the tripartite ministry has sometimes been merged into a single ordained ministry. Three, and sometimes new ministerial offices have been added to the list of the three. And how can this structural diversity be remedied? A major breakthrough was apparently achieved with the so-called Lima text in 1982 on baptism, Eucharist, and ministry, published by the Faith and Order Commission of the World Council of Churches. The world, the Lima text, recognized different structures and ministry in the New Testament, but recommended the threefold ministry of bishop, presbyter, and deacon as ecumenically desirable, if not doctrinally normative. Nonetheless, some recent attempts to unite churches on the basis of a threefold ordained ministry have failed. What has seemingly emerged is a generic ecclesial recognition that has achieved pulpit and altar fellowship, and certainly that is a commendable achievement. But it does leave unanswered a number of ecclesial questions. First, what is the relationship between the ministry of the laity and the ministry of the ordained? And depending on one answer, is ordination really necessary? Number two, by recognizing the need to reform and renew existing ministries, must this be done only within the framework of the tripartite ministry? Or is it permissible to create new ministerial offices. Three, to some, the tripartite ministry seems a restrictive inheritance from the past that has little relevance for the present. In a democratic age, people ask, is it really necessary to have people commissioned for life as leaders in the church? Or should ministry be a commissioning here and now, temporary, not permanent? At least from a Roman Catholic perspective, such questions about church order need to be resolved if corporate union among Christian churches is to be achieved. Third metric, life. On the one hand, the life and work movement was motivated by the experience that doctrine divides but work unites. If Christian unity must wait for theologi theologians to resolve all their doctrinal differences and to reconcile divergent ecclesiastical structures, that wait will last to eternity, if not beyond. <laughs> On the other hand, life and work recognize that there are many social ministries for Christians work together, in spite of their denominational differences, issues like poverty, disease, unemployment, fair housing, voting rights, educational opportunity, discrimination, ecology, the list goes on and on. As Christians joined hearts and hands to work together, they came to realize that there are a number of significant life issues which separate them issues that do not admit a compromise solution, a both-and type of approach. 
One can use that both and type of approach in acknowledging different but complementary doctrinal explanations of justification and sanctification. But there are a number of life issues that are divisive, either or types of issues that require Christians to take a stance. And among such divisive life issues on the American religious scene today is abortion. Stated in its darkest terms, either human life is present from the moment of conception, or it is not. And this ecumenical impasse has been further complicated by two contrasting methodologies. A deductive approach that starts from principles and works to persons. And an inductive approach which starts from the situation of the person in order to postulate appropriate principles. These different methodologies pass each other like ships sailing in different directions. And more pertinently, they arrive at quite different conclusions. At the time of the Reformation, justification was the articulus dantus et cadentus ecclesiae. Life issues, like abortion, may become the doctrine by which ecumenism stands or fails. It is an issue that has, to my knowledge, largely been absent and perhaps avoided in ecumenical conversations. Metric number four, work. And although traditionally life and work have been oriented towards matters of common Christian social concern, one way of translating public service back into Greek is by the word liturgia, which means not only public service, but also divine worship. Life and work has been excellent in emphasizing the public service part of that word in terms of Christian concern for others. But what has been neglected is liturgy as divine worship. And although the Second Vatican Council encouraged Christians to pray together, perhaps the Council's restrictions on non-Catholic Christian participation in the liturgy, restrictions that continue to exist today, have been a deterrent on the development of an ecumenical spirituality. With some exceptions, such as the community at Taizé, ecumenical prayer still remains an occasional event. Thanksgiving, Easter sunrise service, church unity octave, civic ceremonies, and the like. In fact, and the theological students present can confirm this or deny this, but perhaps theological students may be more familiar with the worship of other churches from their classes on liturgics than from actually worshiping Christian churches. But even when they do attend, they are probably not welcome at the Eucharist. Eucharistic sharing is such a neuralgic point that at many ecumenical meetings, there is no service of the word, and then participants disperse to attend a Eucharistic celebration of their choice. In my opinion, at least, the existing Roman Catholic regulations on Eucharistic sharing might well be revised, at least in view of special ecumenical events. In any case, what is urgently needed is the development of an ecumenical spirituality. A spirituality which might include the richnesses of the Christian heritage, the dynamism of the scriptural message, the mysticism of the early church, the majesty of medial polyphony, the eloquence of evangelical preaching, the technological attraction of megachurches, and so on. 
apropos of ecumenical spirituality, one of my ecumenical friends, many years, has emphasized there is not much point to uniting Christians who are theologically knowledgeable, who are socially concerned, unless those Christians are also spiritual people, people of prayer. Metric number five, mission. Seeking a biblical mission and a biblical image that would emphasize unity without uniformity as well as diversity without divisiveness, the ecumenical movement has often been depicted as a pilgrimage. Just as Abraham was called to pack up his baggage and seek the promised land with family, friends, and followers, so too Christians are called to leave their denominational homelands and journey on the road to Christian unity. In contrast to biblical pilgrimages, however, look at modern advertising for pilgrimages. Whether the destination is the Holy Land, Rome, or Geneva, or Wittenberg, notice the advertisement. Comfortable and reliable transportation. <laughs> First class accommodations. Experienced guides. In sum, pilgrimages are guaranteed comfort and satisfaction for the entire trip. Such advertisements seemingly create an expectation that ecumenical pilgrimages be problem free. Or oh, your money back. Uh, in contrast, the ecumenical pilgrimage tends to be problem filled. And at least to some cynics, money poorly invested. The ecumenical pilgrimage seems somewhat like the family trip that brings out both the best in us and the worst in us. And so, three points. The ecumenical pilgrimage calls us to leave the comfortableness of our denominational setting, both the familiarity of its worship and the reliability of its doctrine. For ways of expression that are decidedly different often perplexing, and sometimes totally uncongenial. Two, instead of a carefully planned itinerary, our ecumenical journey often seems to wander without any sense of direction, since there is no built-in global positioning system. <laughs> Much less is there a guide who has traveled the route before. Three. Our ecumenical pilgrimage often experiences unexpected detours, which make us unsure of what our ultimate destination will be, much less the time of our arrival. It should not be surprising then that there have been ecumenical meetings where participation was perfunctory and half-hearted. In fact, there have been some instances where participants have discreetly disappeared, and even a few cases where they have ostentatiously walked out. Since most Catholic participants began joining the ecumenical movement at the time of the Second Vatican Council, and they did so with a feeling of exuberance, perhaps it is not surprising that some people today since an ecumenical winter has set in, or even that ecumenism is in extremis, ready for the last rites. One needs to remember that the ecumenical pilgrimage is not a smooth superhighway. It's more a road under construction. And rough spots, and detours, and so lacking in amenities that ecumenism seems guaranteed to take people out of their denominational comfort zone. If one is going to speak of ecumenism as a journey, it might be helpful to recall the Spanish proverb, el camino se hace por caminar. 
the road is made by walking. Yet without a doubt, the most rewarding aspect of the ecumenical journey are the interesting companions we meet in Rupert. Not simply entertaining raconteurs like the folks in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, though it's always nice at an ecumenical meeting to have one of those raconteurs for sake of entertainment. But really, the joy, the privilege, the grace of ecumenical journey is Christians whose theological insights are thought-provoking. Christians whose lives are committed to Christ, Christians whose dedication to ecumenism is not only deep, but sometimes very courageous. Such fellow Christians make the ecumenical pilgrimage not only enjoyable, but spiritually enriching. Five concluding observations. My cousin's 50th birthday greetings, congratulations and condolences have suggested this set of metrics for evaluating the Second Vatican Council's decree on ecumenism on its 50th birthday. Given the many divisive doctrinal issues that have long plagued and divided Christians, both the quality and quantity of consensus statements is a decidedly impressive legacy, but a legacy that needs to be utilized rather than simply commemorated. Two, if some ministerial issues seem a little less neuralgic than in the past, there are still many persistent problems about the nature of ministry that need to be resolved. Three, while involvement in social concerns is a productive way, a promising way of enlisting the cooperation of Christians, a number of church dividing life issues have, so to speak, caught ecumenists off guard, and these need to be addressed directly. Four, if ecumenically minded Christians have learned to dialogue together about decisive and divisive issues to work together on challenging projects. Christians need to pray together more often than is now the case. Five, although the ecumenical journey has proved more arduous than most people anticipated a half century ago, hopefully Christians will continue to journey together as pilgrims seeking to fulfill Christ's prayer that all may be one. In sum, using the example of my cousin who inherited the stock certificates, one might say that the ecumenical inheritance of Vatican II has not been exhausted. Rather, its full value is yet to be real. And last but not least, the inscription on my cousin's birthday cake may set the appropriate tone for ecumenical proof. Life begins at 50. <laughs> Hopefully, the 50th anniversary wish will be true not only for her, but for ecumenism as well.